Hello and welcome. Uh, my name is Eugene Meyer. I'm president of the Federal Society, and I want to welcome you to uh, our, and delighted to welcome you to our conference on COVID-19 and the law. Uh, we've had six wonderful plan panels planned over the next two days, uh, and we're discussing all kinds of areas where COVID-19 uh, has had impact on, on law, ranging from federal and state, uh, you know, authority and, and, and power, uh, or, uh, civil, civil liberties, elections, regulation, et cetera. Uh, and we're, we're going to start out uh, by addressing uh, specifically the, um, uh, uh, we're, 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 we're going to start, start, start out with addressing uh, government versus private decision making. Um, and you know, how so, so should societies respond to, to pandemic crises? And uh, has, ha, how, how, how has America done? Um, what are the responsibilities of private and public actors? Uh, what, are, what are the risks and benefits of decisions being made by government at all levels, or, and, and for that matter, by, pri by, by the private sector? Um, uh, and uh, what, what, you know, does, does, gov does government decision making about what to close down and what to reopen uh, create some crony capitalism and public choice problems? Or in such an emergency, you know, may maybe in this case, politicians can arise above these temptations. And, you know, another question, what, if anything, does COVID-19 tell us about Medicare for all? Maybe the answer may be nothing now. Uh, our, our structure is going to be uh, each panelist will speak for about eight minutes um, and then uh, we'll have discussion amongst the panelists and questions from the floor. I will repeat this after the question period, but if you have a question and you're on the phone, you can do star nine and that will put you get you'll get a thing putting you in line for the questions. And uh, uh, and if you're on Zoom, you click the raise hand button. Um, uh, now on to the panelists. And my introduction is going to be very brief because all of our panelists, and people say this all the time, in this case, it's really, really true, are very, very distinguished, uh, have, have teach, teach and have taught at top law schools, written in all the top journals, written books. I'm, I'm not going to go over, go over all of that, but it's true for each and every one of them. Um, uh, I'll, our first speaker, and they'll speak in the order I'm introducing them, is Professor Jason Johnson, who is uh, at the University of Virginia Law School uh, and uh, has, uh, as with the other to say, had extensive, uh, extensive writing. Uh, in the area, the next, the next, the next uh, panelist will be uh, Professor Newt Milani from the University of Chicago Law School. Once again, PhDs in both um, uh, a PhD in economics and uh, and and uh, law school uh, is uh, and also written frequently, especially on, on law and economics. Uh, the third one is actually an exception. He does not have a degree in. Uh, in economics. Um, he uh, in, instead actually has a medical degree as a doctor as well as a lawyer. Um, Professor David Hyman from Georgetown Law School uh, as uh, you know focused heavily in his career on healthcare law. Not surprising. And Professor Ian Ayers uh, is our wrap up speaker from from uh, Yale Law School. Uh, also an economics degree as well as a law degree, um, extremely prolific, has written, I think it says 12 books and over 100 law review articles. Um, so maybe you can get your 101st out of this. Um, so without further ado, I wanna turn this over to Professor Johnson to start us off. Professor Johnson. Well, thanks to Gene and thanks to the Federalist Society for putting this together and inviting me to participate. Obviously, I don't think there could be a more important issue than this one. and. Um, I have to say at the outset that we're starting with someone in myself who's only going to make a modest contribution, hopefully a contribution, and then maybe we'll build from this point. But here's what I have to say, really with my economist hat on, uh, not my lawyer hat. I take it that the goal of a COVID response policy should be to minimize the total expected cost, not only the economic cost, but of course the human health cost of uh, this virus. And um, most economists who've looked at this, and over the last two months, quite a few economists have looked at it from that point of view, 
um, it requires looking at both the benefits <coughs> from different policy interventions, such as lockdowns, and the costs of those policy interventions. And uh, my perception is that the potential benefits of different policy responses have been talked about very much, and that there are people in the CDC in particular who opine about those with varying degrees of evidentiary basis, but the cost of different policy responses has not really um, gotten very much rigorous attention, at least in the, in the decision-making sphere. Again, economists have written, I've got a dozen articles sitting on my desk over the last two months about this, but in the actual political decision making, I don't see much discussion, uh, rigorous discussion about the costs of the most extreme policies, such as the lockdowns and shutting down the economy. Uh, what are those costs? We all know now tens of millions of, of people have lost their jobs. Unemployment, businesses are closed, a lot of businesses are not gonna come back. And um, there is a literature in economics on this. Back in the mid 2000s, some really good labor economists, uh, labor economists such as uh, Till von Wachter, looked at the consequences of unemployment, long-term consequences, and the long-term consequences uh, for people who'd had their jobs for a while were depressed future earnings, long periods, long took them a long time to get jobs again, and um, so real economic consequences, and not just real economic consequences to the tune of the loss of about 2.8 years worth of future earnings, but health consequences. Uh, one paper, Quarterly Journal of Economics, one of our best journals in our field, found in 2009 that long-term uh, workers who were unemployed in the mid-80s um, suffered a, a 50 to 100% jump in mortality in the years immediately following the job loss and a persistent long-term 10, 10 to 15% uh, increase in mortality for the years following the job loss, uh, with an average decrease in life expectancy over that entire 20 year period that they uh, discussed of one to one and a half years. I mean, that's a result that's held up. I haven't seen it challenged. Do economists have an explanation for why these horrible health consequences follow upon unemployment? No. But epidemiologists and others have looked at it. There's a bunch of things that they've discovered. It's not just excessive alcohol consumption, tobacco use, but more fine grain studies have um, looked at increases in uh, the hormone uh, cortisol, which as we know is pretty damaging. That's the stress cortisol uh, hormone and also decreased immune function. So I, I just haven't seen any discussion of this and you cannot possibly have a rational policy if you don't take account of the enormous economic costs and health costs of putting so many people out of work and shutting down so many businesses. Um, and the question is, why has that happened? Well, there's a marvelous book by the historian, liberal historian, Barbara Tuckman. Some of you may know it. I don't think students read it anymore, but it's called The March of Folly. And as she says, or she said, mankind, it seems, make a, makes a poorer performance of government than of almost any other human activity. In this sphere, wisdom, which may define, be defined as the exercise of judgment acting on experience, common sense, and available information, is less operative and more frustrated than it should be. As she concludes, this is her introduction, but why does intelligent mental process seem so often not to function? Well, of course, government can be wooden-headed, as she goes on to describe it, and I think there's a lot of wooden-headedness that has taken place in this crisis. Um, but I'm not, I'm not trying to say that private behavior, private actors can't be wooden-headed. Um, Jeff Immel took uh, control of General Electric, which was a great corporation, and over the process of 10 years, essentially destroyed it. Uh, and that happened, that took 10 years, and then they you know, General Electric, General Electric is where it is. On the other hand, there are differences between the public sector and the private sector. Um, it may be, it sometimes does take a long time to get rid of a CEO who has adopted a disastrous strategy that doesn't properly weigh uh, costs and benefits of different choices that are being made from the corporation's point of view. Um, but in the private sector, you can find 
failures, such as the GE situation. But the predominant ethic, the predominant incentive is, was expressed in Andy Grove uh, by his book, Only the Paranoid Survive. The point being that if managers of profit-making corporations are not constantly on the inert alert for new challenges and new ways to meet them, they and their companies will not survive. This is not true in the political sphere. Uh, it seems to me in the public sphere, I don't know exactly what the payoff functions are of the politicians who have been uh, dictating primarily through emergency executive orders, the legality of which will be discussed, I'm sure, by other panels. I don't know exactly what, we, what an economist would call their objective function, what it is they're trying to do. And usually we think politicians are trying to get reelected or maybe they're trying to get somebody else not elected. I don't know. But it just seems whatever their objective functions are, we don't have a means, anything like the market, which exposes them to continuous market discipline, as you would have, for example, if you were a CEO of a publicly traded corporation and you made a major mistake uh, with your earnings accounting and that came to light because that would end you and that would probably almost end the corporation. Doesn't seem to be the same case in the, in the public sphere. And I do think, how much time do I have left, guys? Uh, you've got uh, about two minutes. Yeah, I do think, you know, just to emphasize, what would these mistakes be? I mean, I'm trying to say that I think the incentives that our public actors fa faced in this crisis have led to mistakes. Everybody jumps on the nursing homes. It does sound awful to send um, uh, really old people who were in nursing homes and had COVID and went to the hospital back. But honestly, I don't know where they were supposed to go. I don't know where they were supposed to be discharged to. So I can't comment on that, but I can comment on is this. Uh, we have a, a son who's uh, relatively, who's 10 going on 11, and uh, he can't do anything this summer. They've canceled everything. And it, that's, to my mind, that is completely irrational. Why is it irrational? I've got a piece of paper in front of me looking at the numbers. 126 deaths. This was as of the end of May, as reported by the CDC. 126 COVID deaths for people 24 and younger, far fewer, like 16 for people 15 and under. Um, the death rate as a percentage of the population, there's 103 million people in this country who are under the age of 24. That works out to a death rate of, uh, I know we can't express this in a common sense way, but 0 0.0000012. For people 85 plus, there are um, really uh, a lot of COVID deaths, 85 plus, 29,214 deaths in that population segment. There's only 5.9 million people who are over 85. If we figure out that death rate, that death rate is what? That death rate is pretty darn high. And it, in fact, what it is, is 0 0.0049. It's half a percent. What's the ratio of the death rate of older people above 85 to people who are under 24, it's 400,000 percent. That's, that's not the ratio. The ratio is for, you know, uh, for, for, uh, it's 400,000 percent higher. That's what we would say. So a rational policy would recognize that and distinguish between these different groups in terms of their susceptibility to, you know, the most serious of all complications from the disease, which is death. And yet the policies don't seem to do that. The policies seem to be, in a way, targeted at restricting the activities of the, the least vulnerable. Uh, and that cannot make sense. There's, as I said, economists have looked at this and the uniform conclusion from the theoretical slash both, both theoretical and empirical studies so far is, you know, targeted policies minimize costs and give you the biggest bang for your buck, but targeted policies protect the most vulnerable. In this case, people who are over 85 years of age. They do not target the least vulnerable and impose costs for no reason. So uh, the, then the question becomes, how did this happen? And I'll finish with a quote from Tuckman, which is, wooden headedness consists in assessing a situation in terms of preconceived fixed notions while ignoring or rejecting any contrary signs. It is epitomized by historian's statement about Philip II of Spain. No experience of the failure of his policy could shake his belief in its essential excellence. 
And that does seem to have happened here with some of our uh, public figures. These are governors primarily, uh, but I suppose also um, lower level political officials who have chosen policies and failed to, to adapt those policies to the evidence as it comes in. They adapted a policy, maybe it made sense given incomplete information in the beginning, but as we've gotten more and more information about this disease, policies should have changed and should have adapted in a much more nuanced way than they have. Thank, and thank, that's you. Yeah. thank you, Professor Johnson. Uh, let's turn uh, to Professor Malani. Uh, so thank you, Gene, and to the Federalist Society for inviting me. I want to first give a little bit of background on what I've been doing on COVID uh, and then turn to uh, my remarks, substantive remarks. Um, the background is just to give context uh, for why I say the things that I'm going to say. So the, uh, I've been doing basically three things during COVID. The first is uh, mainly working in India uh, I have an organization called the International Innovation Corps that sends U.S. graduates to go work on development projects in India uh, for periods of uh, one to three years. Uh, we had a team at the Ministry of Health, and as soon as uh, COVID crisis uh, came along, they were immediately tasked to work on the pandemic war room in Delhi. And so that's one. A second one is that uh, uh, based upon information I was getting from the team, we realized the government needed a lot more support. So uh, working with the IDFC Institute in Bombay, we put together a private task force to support the government. So this was a task force of CEOs of a lot of the major uh, corporations in India, uh, Facebook, Amazon, uh, 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 Flipkart, uh, and the like. Uh, also the largest hospital chains and labs, uh, big foundations, and uh, the president of the World Bank. And the idea was basically just to support the efforts of the different states and the government uh, in, in COVID response and particularly focusing on coordination failures uh, when governments have to talk to each other to enforce things like a lockdown or to, to, to get testing underway. Also there, we've been uh, at uh, India at this time, um, uh, didn't have a lot of people that were doing mathematical modeling of, of epidemics. And so we formed a task group, uh, kind of a working group in the United States <clears throat> with professors from MIT, uh, University of Chicago, Stanford, uh, and Duke to basically provide uh, that sort of modeling and also econometric analysis of the impact of policies, uh, non-pharmaceutical interventions in particular in India, and then provide that information back to the states. And so right now we're working with uh, two out of the three largest states in India uh, and the central government on COVID response, uh, thinking about dynamic control of, of COVID and also uh, trying to do community testing efforts. So that's the work in India. Uh, in addition, uh, I've recently joined a, a panel uh, formed by the Asian Development Bank to help the ASEAN countries uh, exit from lockdown, thinking both on the health side and the economic reform side. And the last is, uh, as many people here have been participating, I've been participating in some of the, the policy debates um, uh, uh, involved uh, with COVID. In my case, it was particularly over uh, discussions over immunity passports. Okay, so with that background and the kind of the, the, the experiences and information I've gotten from that, I've, I've, I want to talk about four basic ideas when it comes to thinking about private versus government response. The first one is uh, um, when we think about uh, COVID policymaking, we need information on two sorts of information. One is we need to know what the private benefits and costs of, of different policies are, say lockdown versus voluntary social distancing. So how much risk am I at from getting COVID personally based upon my behavior? And how much do I lose by not being able to engage in economic activity? That varies across people and individual people have information about their individual circumstances. So I think of that as, as private uh, benefits and costs. But we also want to know about social or external benefits and costs, like uh, what is my probability of infecting somebody else or what are the benefits that my economic activity have on other people and gains to trade. In general, we think that private individuals have better knowledge than the government does about their own private costs and benefits. However, we also think that the government may know social benefits better uh, than we do or at least have better incentives and ability to control those external effects. And really, when you're choosing between government decision making and private decision making, you're really choosing, and, and what I mean by that is something like choosing between lockdown or lockdown type policies versus voluntary social distancing, you're really making a decision about whether or not the private information or the social information is more important. Um, and I think that's an important framing that we have. And, and, that's, and with that framing, I think you can think of a, a few issues that arise uh, 
uh, in COVID response. So, uh, and that also make COVID response a little complicated. The first is, I think one people, one thing that people think is that government uh, decision-making is helpful because it can coordinate uh, activities a little better, focusing on the external effects. Uh, lockdown is the example of this. But the difficulty is that um, uh, the government wasn't appreciating private information, private behavior. Uh, and that's why we're finding now that there's more and more studies suggesting these non-pharmaceutical interventions the social distancing uh, efforts have not had a big impact on mobility. In fact, that there's a lot of voluntary social distancing. In fact, today, later, uh, there's a presentation by Austin Goldsby and Chad Syverson at the University of Chicago that uses mobile phone data to show that across borders in states that had a lockdown versus not, you had very similar reductions in mobility, suggesting there's a lot of voluntary social distancing. Another thing uh, 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 that we are learning is that there are super spreaders and super spreader events. Uh, uh, the, uh, and those have a disproportionate effect, a disproportionate effect on the spread of the, the infection. But again, that's often or very often private information. The last thing we learned about the private versus uh, public in this context is not merely the private benefit and, and private costs, but also sometimes the private sector is better at coming up at innovations. So for example, uh, if you think about kind of the main innovations we're seeing in infection control, very often they originate in academia uh, or in companies. Uh, so, for example, we see how important, for example, uh, say, uh, ad tech companies who generally do advertising are to doing contact tracing now. So that's innovation that occurs in real time in the private sector uh, that helps, not necessarily in the government. OK, so that was point number one, information. Point number two is a question of how much information the government has. So one of the things that we learned early on is that in India is that the government didn't had been given a whole range of models about what the impact of COVID is going to be. Some very alarm alarmist, some less so, with differences in projections on the order of the hundreds of millions of people being infected in one but not in the other. And the government didn't have an idea of which model was better, which experts to trust. Uh, so one of the early tasks that we had was actually to go and and take every single model that had been presented to the government and compare them uh, where possible and see. Uh, wh which one to believe. And, and our lesson from that is that uh, these models are more qualitative than quantitative at this point because we, we lack information on basic, um, basic parameters. But the important thing here is that the government didn't know which model was better. So just assuming that there's external benefits doesn't mean that you know what to do about the external benefits. Also important in this context is that we've learned that politics really affects knowledge. Um, uh, and our best example of that is testing incentives. Uh, India has a very low testing rate. You could argue the United States doesn't have as high a testing rate as many people would like. The question is why? In India, I can tell you the answer. Um, there are a lot of government officials who don't want to test because they want to open up the economy. Uh, they want to eliminate from, uh, a release from lockdown. They think that they're losing votes uh, if they keep the lockdown going longer. So they don't want to test because they don't want to learn that there are a lot of cases, which means that they have less information to guide policy in the first place. An important issue here is that that politicians also have incentives and sometimes perverse ones in the context of democracy, uh, and that can affect their ability to gather information even on external benefits. So that was point number two. Point number three is that government capacity is complicated. Again, I'll use India as an example. India is one of the lowest ratios of police to population. Yet, interestingly, it had one of the harshest lockdowns in the world. Retail mobility after the lockdown fell 70%. Work mobility fell 40%, and this is according to Google Mobility Reports. And the question is, how is that possible with so few cops? And the answer is actually kind of simple. If you do a lockdown, there are very few people that are supposed to be on the street. So you, you know who is a violator right away. You don't need a lot of cops to find the violator of the rule. The problem is that once you start opening up and there's more activity going on, a lot of it legitimate and a lot of it Ill, Ill, and some of it illegitimate, it's going to be harder for a small number of cops to find the illegitimate activity. So in fact, in India, you have two choices, either full lockdown or no lockdown. And those are the things that are compatible with low capacity. Um, so it's very non-monotonic in terms of what, what, your, what your capacity is. That also means that your policy space is much more restricted, which is something that we don't think about. We think that everything is possible. We just have to de decide the degree of social distancing, and it's not always the case. Now, you might think that that's an India-specific problem, but I think the, the events of the recent weeks suggest that it's also a problem in the United States. When just one or two people want to loot, the, uh, uh, the police in most American cities can shut that down. But when a lot of people are looting, you exceed the capacity of the police to keep that under control. And so you can get a, a, a kind of a, a big takeoff uh, in the amount of looting. Uh, so you really have to keep in mind what your capacity is and how coordinated private activity is. The last point I wanna make is just about uh, something that we all know about, which is the Overton window, which is the range of ideas that it's, it's acceptable to express, including policy ideas in response to COVID and how that shifts over time. Um, 
that shift that occurs is partially due to what private individuals feel is comfortable uh, to talk about. And, and that changes over time as we get information. That also changes, for example, what's okay for the government to talk about or do. Uh, so for example, uh, it is outside the Overton window right now to talk about the idea of doing experimentation on like purposeful experimentation on individuals where you infect them in order to learn a little bit more about COVID, even though that might have huge external benefits. That's just not an acceptable conversation. Nor is it acceptable to talk about intentionally government coordinated self-infection in order to, uh, to facilitate a, a workforce that's recovered and can participate without infecting other people. What is acceptable and only recently so is the idea of immunity passports. So immunity passports are situations where people might get infected, not in a coordinated fashion and not run by the government, but once they get infected, they might get certificates that allow them to participate. Some of these things are in the are acceptable policy discussions. Some of these are not acceptable policy discussions. That's kind of a, a, the result of some sort of equilibrium that we have that's very hard to describe on what's acceptable behavior versus not, but it importantly constrains what the government can do. Um, it's also the case that that's going to change over time and that there's interaction between the two. So for example, right at the beginning, uh, uh, you know, back in January, February, it was okay to say that COVID was not a big issue. Now it's soon after that, it became an issue. You can't say COVID is, is not an issue, that you had to be very strongly in favor of, of social distancing. Now we're in a situation where lockdown's released and it's okay to go back to that or original position. So again, the, the Overton window is shifting and it's something we need to keep in mind when we think about, about government policymaking. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, Professor Hyman. Uh, thanks, Gene. Um, my, my remarks are going to build on the first two, uh, but are going to have a slightly more clinically focused uh, and perhaps regulatory focused bent. Um, I teach a first year elective course at Georgetown called How to Regulate. And the second half of the course is organized around case studies of regulatory successes and regulatory failures drawn from different areas of the administrative state. This year, every week, I find myself found myself repeatedly reminding the students that they should just watch the news if they wanted to find examples of regulatory failure and of some regulatory successes. We've observed screw-ups at every level of government by pretty much every responsible agency. <clears throat> now, if you study the history of regulation or you read Barbara Tuckman or you listen to Jason's opening remarks, uh, that won't come as a big surprise. Regulation is hard even under the best of circumstances and the early days of a pandemic are not the best of circumstances. Nobody in power wants to be responsible for the deaths of hundreds of thousands of people, especially if they were presented with models suggesting that outcome, unless they took dramatic steps to stop that from happening. And it's hard to know the counterfactual. We also have expectations about government behavior that are different from those we have for private parties. The combination put lots of pressure on all the weak points in our systems compounded by politics, the partisan desire, divide, and everybody's desire to play gotcha in an election year. That said, it's important to ask the compared to what question. Previous disasters in the past 20 years, think 9-11, hurricanes Katrina, Maria, and Sandy, the financial crisis, Deepwater Horizon, to just list a few, haven't exactly painted a great picture of government preparedness. Obviously, pandemics raise continuing risks of scale and scope that are different than other types of emergencies, but the point remains that we should peg our expectations at a reasonable level for the decisions that are going to be made. I'm going to focus most of my time on the federal response, but I'll have a bit to say about the states and then <clears throat> hopefully close out by uh, <clears throat> asking the compared to what question, private versus public. Um, so first, the Department of Health and Human Services. Everybody, I suspect, remembers the big fuss that we had about ventilators, the vital shortage of ventilators, that the projections were that we needed huge amounts and we didn't have enough. Um, and I think that mostly went by the boards when it became clear that ventilators were not going to be needed at nearly that level and were not a cure-all for COVID. Um, but it's important to note some of the history here. Um, Back in about uh, 2006, the federal government decided that it would need about 70,000 ventilators in a moderate influenza epidemic. Uh, and so they decided to try and contract to buy a bunch of ventilators. Sensible decision, sensible precautions. Uh, instead of going with a large established device maker who weren't interested in making the sort of small, inexpensive ventilators that HHS wanted for its stockpile, they hired a small ventilator company, Newport Medical Instruments, to build a fleet of inexpensive portable devices. 
Um, before production started, that company was purchased by a larger device manufacturer, which backed out of the contract. No ventilators were delivered. Uh, and finally, in 2019, the government signed up a new ventilator company. Uh, so from 2006 to 2019, we had efforts to uh, have a contract to purchase excess ventilators, um, but basically it didn't get followed through, I think, for a complex set of reasons, including rules about government contracting, the incentives, lack of visibility, and so on. Uh, but compounding that, the government did have a stockpile of ventilators, but it led a contract dispute with uh, the company that it had signed up with to do maintenance on those laps. And the result of that was even the ventilators we had, a significant chunk of them weren't working. So 14 years after the call for ventilators went out, the federal government is just starting to fill the need. Um, now, what about the strategic national stockpile? I suspect people heard a lot about that early in the days of the pandemic as well. It's supposed to include ventilators, but also personal protective equipment, antibiotics, vaccines, and a lot of other supplies. This was uh, the brainchild of Bill Clinton, a very, very smart idea. Uh, it was created in 1999. The strategic national stockpile proved its value in responding to Katrina and H1N1. But the supplies got depleted and a dispute between the White House, first in the Obama administration and subsequently in the Trump administration, and Congress prevented it from being replenished. So, uh, you know, this is politics. Uh, this is priorities. Um, nobody was willing to expend the political capital or give on their core uh, priorities to get it funded and fully furnished in advance. And that's the kind of thing that I think you can ding the government for while simultaneously understanding how it happened. There was plenty of blame to go around, but as a taxpayer, if we had a strategic stockpile, it's not at all obvious why we allowed it to be depleted and remain depleted. We shouldn't expect private companies to maintain that level of a strategic stockpile. Uh, they can scale up in response to pandemics, but they're not going to have a stockpile that's going to be available when we need it. Second, the FDA. Um, in February, the FDA declared a public health emergency. A side effect of that declaration was to make it effectively impossible for private labs to conduct their own testing without obtaining authorization from the FDA. And that, you know, bureaucratic structure uh, meant that you basically slammed on the brakes for private labs being able to do this. The only tests that could be done were those that were developed by the CDC and distributed to public health labs. Uh, and that meant we weren't going to do very much testing at all. Now, that was compounded by some additional problems with the CDC. More on that in a second. Uh, but in addition, you know, the FDA slammed the brakes on private attempts to use existing available data to evaluate the scale of the COVID epidemic. So the Seattle flu study was ongoing. They were collecting samples, but they couldn't get authorization from the FDA to run COVID tests. So they decided to do it themselves, and they received uh, orders to cease and desist. Uh, first in March, and then subsequently, just three weeks ago, they got a final order saying that they couldn't do any of their own testing uh, without obtaining FDA authorization. So, you know, that's that's not a particularly inspiring picture of adaption to an emergency when the consequences, we tell you, you can't do anything. Finally, the CDC, basically everything they touched uh, got messed up one way or another. Uh, they're the sort of keystone cops of disease control. If you want uh, Jason's wooden, head, wooden headedness uh, as a case study, uh, the New York Times had a headline in an article about a week ago, the CDC, quote, waited its entire existence for this moment, what went wrong, right? And so, first of all, the tests they developed, uh, turned out to be precise, but it was also contaminated. So when you distribute it and you're getting both false positives and false negatives at a much higher rate than you would like, that's not a particularly good test. Um, they also didn't target tests on the people uh, that were most vulnerable, uh, nor on uh, the broader population because they didn't have very many tests. Instead, they strictly limited who could receive the tests. Not a good way to track an epidemic. They had rotten IT, not a surprise to anybody who's followed the way the government handles IT and other domains. 
Uh, but the result was uh, about a month ago at a, a meeting, Dr. Deborah Burks was quoted as saying to the head of the CDC, quote, there is nothing from the CDC that I can trust. So that, you know, the public, the private sector doesn't have to do all that well for it to do better than that. Um, so, you know, bureaucracy and risk aversiveness, incentives, funding, politics, all of these things matter. Uh, and they all affected those federal agencies at the state level. Um, I think you can ding different states for different things. Um, I'm a little harder on the, uh, the requirement uh, to discharge people with COVID from hospitals to nursing homes without making sure that there was adequate personal protective equipment and isolation ability within the nursing home. Had they been able to do that, I think it would have played out very differently. Uh, but because of the way that it was structured, you must discharge these people. Uh, but we're not going to worry about PPE. The result was to introduce to a very vulnerable population uh, a, a site of infection at multiple facilities. And that's partly why the rates are so high. Uh, in New Jersey, there's a whistleblower letter that uh, says that their public health response has been, quote, an unmitigated failure and the administration is making things up as they proceed. Other states have been playing games with how they report cases. Um, uh, and I can name the states in the Q&A if people want to know, uh, but it, it's quite common for, among other things, uh, states to report, not report as nursing home deaths people who were in a nursing home when they got COVID and then got transferred to a hospital. Um, and so that can give you a distorted impression of the actual uh, death rates associated with being in a nursing home. Other states are grouping together viral tests and antibody tests. Uh, which gives you a distorted impression as well. And so I'm going to uh, now wrap up because uh, Gene wants me to do that. Um, I think it's important for you to ask the compared to what question here. Um, the, the private sector um, obviously has its own areas of responsibility, uh, but it doesn't have to do perfectly for it to do better than this. And one final point, I think it's important to recognize, and this is really a transition to Ian, uh, politics uh, plays a far greater role in public health policy than it does in general health policy. And the sort of uh, flip-flops and recommendations we're seeing on social distancing uh, and in the context of the recent uh, rallies and uh, public demonstrations, I think have a lot to do with that. So let me stop there. Thank you very much. Th thanks, and uh, as you said, good tra transition to uh, Professor Ayers. Uh, if you uh, Google the Federal Society and Black Lives Matter, the top entries only concern events where Federalist uh, Society speakers criticize the uh, Black Lives Matter uh, movement. Uh, I, I call upon the Federalist Society to issue a statement acknowledging that Black Lives Matter. Uh, this is, of course, not unrelated to the COVID pandemic because our nation is gripped in, uh, in mass demonstrations that have not been seen uh, in recent times. And these demonstrations, even when peaceful, create public health risks and at times violate not just curfews, but public health restrictions on the size of public gatherings. Uh, how should protesters be punished for peaceful acts of civil disobedience? Uh, one limited claim is that the law should not set punishments with the goal of deterring all civil disobedience. Instead, I'm attracted to the idea of what I'll call a collective liability rule. Uh, if one person lies down uh, on I-95 and causes the delay in traffic that creates third-party costs of $20,000, then a liability-like fine or punishment for that person of $20,000 would force that individual to internalize the costs of her disobedience. But if 1,000 people lie down on I-95 and cause third-party costs of $20,000, then a collective liability rule would only fine each $10. When crime is speech, we should have different uh, punishment rules. Uh, what courts should not do is uh, evaluate, uh, <coughs> make the punishment based on their assessment of whether the pro protester's cause is righteous or not. So a protester violating the public gathering restrictions in order to pray or to protest the Second Amendment should be treated the same. 
uh, there are, are other several other considerations that uh, should impact the appropriate punishment, such as whether the third parties to the protest had any relation or not to the thing being protested, or how one goes about valuing the injury to others. But my time is short, and I want to turn to my second and last point. Uh, the most important behavioral economics article ever published uh, was published in Science in 1981 by Amos Tversky and Daniel Kahneman, and it uh, has more than 20,000 citation, and it lays out the author's uh, foundational prospects theory. It's called uh, The Framing of Decisions and the Psychology of Choice, and it begins by describing a classroom experiment using just 152 students from Stanford and the University of British uh, Columbia. And this study has a, a particular relevance to the current pandemic. Uh, all the subjects uh, began by um, being told the following prompt. Imagine that the US is preparing for the outbreak of an unusual Asian disease, which is expected to kill 600 people. Two alternative programs to combat, combat the disease have been proposed. Assume that the exact scientific estimation of the consequences of the program is as follows. And then the subjects were randomly assigned to one of two different groups. The gain or positive frame was told that if program A is adopted, 200 people will be saved. If program B is adopted, there is a one-third probability that 600 people will be saved and a two-thirds probability that no people will be saved. Which of the two programs would you favor? And then the other half of subjects were given the negative or loss frame, and they were told if program A is adopted, 400 people will die, and if program B is adopted, there's a one-third probability that nobody will die and a two-thirds probability that 600 people will die. And again, this, this group was also asked, which of the two programs would you favor, which is what is widely known probably by everybody on the panel and most in the audience is that participants were two and a half times more likely to choose the risk averse option when confronted with the gain frame and 3.5 times more likely to choose the risk seeking option when confronted with the negative frame. And so what's the relevance of this study to the current pandemic? Well, we might be concerned that people who adopt a loss frame would, for behavioral uh, reasons, arbitrarily favor options that preserve the possibility of that few lives would be lost. Uh, loss frames, I think, would lead some to favor flattening the curve, which at least puts off the number of people dying, while people who adopt the gain frame would arbitrarily favor the let it rip Swedish approach for accepting a more certain but large number of deaths. The central point of the Tversky and Kahneman experiment was that the two frames in their study was constructed to be economically equivalent, uh, or equivalent in all ways. But uh, most choices are not so constructed. Uh, and so a, a simple uh, ending point is that we should try to favor cost-benefit analysis of alternative policies that are independent of these gain or loss framing effects. Thanks. Thank you. Um, uh, oh, one thing I'd say very quickly, by the way, in your opening comment, the Federal Society has never in its 35 years of history taken a position on anything uh, or issued a statement on anything in that way. So uh, that, that might answer your, your question there. Um, uh, the, uh, for those of you who, are, uh, who might wish to ask a question, I'm going to mention again before we have discussion amongst the panelists that uh, if you want to, to, to hit star nine if you're on the phone or click the raise hand button if you are on Zoom. Um, uh, now I'm going to give people a, ch a chance to respond or react to what, they, what they've heard. Um, and we can go in the order we started in, um, uh, uh, but uh, with only with only four of four panels on the panel, I think people can pipe up when they when they want to, pretty much. But uh, Professor Johnson, do you have comments on things? You're a mute. I think All you're right. muted. 
I just did what my students did last semester. I forgot to mute myself. I mean, unmute myself. Uh, do I have any con No, I thought everything everybody said was very interesting and um, I'm happy to respond to questions. Okay. Um, uh, 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 other, other people have, have reactions? One thing I'm going to throw out as a question is Professor Johnson basically said in his, in his talk, as I heard it, uh, the response to much of this has been irrational. Uh, and I'm interested in people's reaction to that. I mean, that, that's a fairly, uh, uh, and, and certainly there were some questions raised by, by, by other speakers about responses. But, um, uh, sure. You know, what, 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 do we, what do we make of that? Did he overstate that or is, is... I think you did slightly, Jason. So I'm, uh, I'm attracted to the uh, scholarship of uh, Darren Osamoglu suggesting that targeted uh, shutdown strategies are likely to uh, uh, be uh, powerful uh, responses that are, uh, that can give us most of the bang for the buck of the uh, untargeted shutdown. Uh, but uh, the uh, sacrificed summer of your uh, uh, child is not by itself uh, 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 clear, strong evidence because uh, the more extreme case uh, is imagine that there was a 0% chance that uh, your child would succumb to this disease, it still might be rational to uh, sacrifice uh, uh, his summer uh, if it had a big enough negative externality uh, uh, by killing uh, grandparents. And, uh, and, I, uh, and so I, I, just, I heard just a few sentences of yours uh, to make the strong case that this low probability of, of death was a, uh, was a sufficient proof that he shouldn't be uh, restrained in his dealings. And uh, that, just as an a priori matter, isn't uh, well established. Can I respond? Um, well, yeah, I mean, I had sort of abbreviated time. All the data on kids that's come in shows, and I mean kids 12 and under shows, not only do they not get the disease or they get it with an extremely low probability, <clears throat> but they transmit it with an extremely low probability. The schools have been open in Scandinavia, I believe, since the end of April, and kids are not getting the disease, they're not transmitting the disease. And, um, I, and I, I used our son as an example, but quite frankly, he's not the person, the kid who's being mostly affected by this. The clubs we belong to, he's still able to do what he needs to do. The kids who are being affected by this are the kids in Charlottesville, the poor kids, and they've closed everything. They closed the boys and girls clubs, clubs activities. They've closed everything. And I don't know what those kids are doing. It's just like with this COVID thing in general, right? Who has been impacted? We haven't been impacted. You know, law professor, economist type, types like us. The people who have been impacted are the people in the service industries, the people who work in the factories. Um, the millennials have been blown, blown out of the water by this, which is just the most recent of the sort of depth charges that they view as the, the uh, uh, baby boomers dumping on them. And the people who have been hurt are people who are, are you know, uh, not in a, are, are not at a great advantage economically. So uh, I just think there is a lot more data on the, on the kids being uh, not at risk. I just didn't have time to get into all of it. But I think the data from Scandinavia where the schools have really been open a pretty long time uh, is, 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 to my mind, at least pretty probative. Yeah, the low transmission uh, that they are less likely to transmit to others is, uh, is what I would have just emphasized more. Yeah, because that elim eliminates the externality. I mean, there's no, the, the externality is gone. But the thing is, parents, I don't, I want to take up everybody's time. But this, to my mind, one of the things the government should have done is emphasize where the risk is low. Governments emphasized, did everything they could to emphasize how high the risk was, how, how people should take precautions they wouldn't have taken anyway. And I don't know how many um, sort of behavioral econ papers have been done on this. I've seen a couple, 
where they've gone out and talked to people. What they found out is people tend to, to overestimate the risk uh, uh, to them personally. And that's, I think, what you'd predict given what we know about how people process uh, this kind of information and, and do tend to, tend to overestimate the probability of these potentially really catastrophic outcomes. If I could chime in, I wanted to add three things, uh, but be a little bit more general than the specific debate that, uh, that, that Jason and Ian are having. Um, the first thing is, uh, I think that one thing that allows what I think Jason is calling irrational behavior is that we have very little information about the disease. Uh, we don't know the efficacy of NPIs. We don't know, uh, for example, what, what community prevalence is in a lot of areas. We don't know what the positive predictive value, value is of having certain symptoms like high temperature. We still have difficulty in understanding what the sensitivity and specificity of different tests are. Uh, just the other day, the WHO issued a controversial statement about uh, asymptomatics not being as uh, contagious, uh, not having high levels of transmissibility. Those are some basic things uh, that we don't know. And I think in our, our lack of knowledge about those things is what allows us to make decisions that in hindsight, once the information does come out, seem so irrational. It also allows politics to play a much bigger role. Uh, which is why the framing points that I think Ian were making was, was very important. I know he wasn't stressing the political aspect of the framing, but the political framing can have a big impact when you just have very little data. I think the big puzzle here is why do we know so little? Uh, these are not like parameters that, that we didn't know we needed to know. It's not like we can't have designs that get us this. Community testing, easy to do. It's easy to do more systematic testing of tests. It's easy to under, like, for example, it'd be super easy to figure out how, what the positive predictive value of different symptoms are. We're just not doing it. And I think that's kind of the, the big puzzle is why have we failed to answer these questions? Part of this answer is, I think, going to be our reticence to experiment in ways that make us uncomfortable. So, for example, doing human trials involving COVID, even with payment, would have answered a lot of these questions and have saved a lot of lives ex post. So if we're a little bit consequentialist, you could make an argument that that would have been a good idea, but we don't do that. But even beyond that, we're actually in many cases systematically stopping private entities from actually doing this experimentation. And the question is, why is that happening? And by the way, it's not just private entities. Very often I see conflicts within the government between different government arms. And we're still tr struggling to figure out why it is that people are are doing that when, when the value of that information is, is really, really important. Hey, Gene, can I issue one quick yes. clarification? When I say irrational, I just mean in a sort of technical economic sense, the people are not up, don't seem to be updating their beliefs about the relevant probabilities here of both infection and transmission in different groups and acting on those in an economically rational way. That's a kind of, um, I don't mean irrational in, you know, I mean it in that technical sense. So the only only thing, so I, I understand that, I that definition. I, I would just say it's a little bit complicated because I don't know right now um, what the truth is. I know that there's pieces of information out there, but my, my sense is that the, the confidence intervals on a lot of the policies that you're talking about are still so wide um, that, that it permits a lot of activities that we cannot right now judge to be rational or irrational. And we might learn later on are irrational or, or rational in the first place, although for not the reasons that we thought. So in that context, it's just hard to make a judgment, which, which is not an excuse for not updating, by the way. We should still be updating, but it, it explains why we have such... But I do want to second one thing you said. I mean, I just couldn't agree with you more about why haven't we been doing certain kinds of tests? I mean, I don't know, months ago, Kotlikoff, Lawrence Kotlikoff and his brother came out with the idea of randomly testing small groups. You know, if everybody's negative, you move on to the next sample. I don't think we've been doing that. I don't think we've been testing. Uh, I don't know how the testing's being done, but we should have a fairly accurate test by this time, it seems to me. We should be doing it, um, um, you know, with large groups of people. And also, what about the cost of testing? Why? Should, why? I'll, I'll make one final point. Just from this is very anecdotal, just from talking to people, uh, and I'm in a very small town, uh, not even really in Charlottesville, but Albemarle County, talking to people, there are a lot of people who got sick in January and February. And I mean, there's a one guy who lives in our neighborhood whose son works at a restaurant, and the owner went back to Wuhan in December and then came back to the restaurant. He was sick. And six or seven people who worked at the restaurant got sick, and our friend got sick from his son who's, I think, 19 or 20, um, that's information. I know it's not a formal test, 
but that's interesting information. Why can't we just have some sort of database where we compile that kind of information? Maybe it's just too unreliable and it would just wipe, wash out as noise. But I think there are a lot of other ways to try to get information about underlying um, infection rates. If I can just echo, Anup, um, I think we know a lot more than we did. We don't know nearly as much as we should. Uh, but the interesting thing is when people try and reverse prior decisions, uh, the politics of it often causes people to you know, go nuclear uh, in response. So uh, my recollection is Georgia you know, proposed to reopen the state to varying degrees, and that was analogized to human sacrifice uh, in the pages of the Atlantic. Um, that strikes me as a massive overreaction based on what we actually know um, and don't know about COVID-19. And that's, I think, a broader problem, how this has gotten uh, tangled up with the broader politics that I mentioned in my remarks. Well, one, one other question I would ask uh, before turning it over to our, our audience to ask questions. Um, <clears throat> what is, you've talked a lot, a lot about what, <clears throat> how, to, how, to, how to judge the, 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 the current efforts. Has, and prof I think it was Professor Johnson talked in his initial thing about the cost to pe the cost to to people economically and in and 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 then ultimately in terms of health or lives uh, of the of the of the shutdown. How much? How much? Con what what do we think about uh, about that? I mean, how how much of the cost? You know, how do we try to judge the 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 cost or damage? Particularly, I would say to the bottom quarter or bottom third of society in terms of uh, uh, in income and uh, uh, how do how do we judge those costs versus the direct health costs and health dangers which are also probably in that group? Well I think we we can measure it. I mean what should be happening is we're going to look at people and we're going to look at people who've been unemployed. And uh, we'll have data on what happens disease-wise, not COVID, but I mean, what happens with their health outcomes after this, and mortality. Um, so we have data. Um, and we'll just, unfortunately, this is this terrible experiment that we've run in deliberate mass unemployment and deliberate mass shutting down of small businesses. And we will get data uh, on what happens to the people who have suffered those events. Um, and I don't think, I don't know, but I have a feeling it's not going to look very good. And I think it's going to be really, really tragic. What, what do we do given we don't have, uh, yeah, obviously decisions have to be made and even now are being made before all that data is in. So how do we, how do we go about trying to figure that out? Anybody have any thoughts? Well, is the question, how do we quantify it or what should we do about it if we assume it's going to be a problem based on what we know previously? Well, how, with, and this happens all the time in every field, how with inadequate data do we go about making the very real decisions that we have to make? Uh, this is well, I can just say this. Government agencies do this all the time. Uh, I'm finishing a book I've been writing forever on, on climate change policy. Um, the Environmental Protection Agency um, – does not try to attach uh, any actual dollar number to the cost of unemployment caused by new regulations. And that's in part because um, their models show that really there aren't that many jobs lost, but that's something that one could dispute. But the point is they have a very simple way of figuring out um, how many jobs lo are lost as a cons consequence of regulation. It's invalid. I don't think it's a good way. But there are shorthand ways that one can do this. One can do a lot better than EPA did. And you can say, look, we've caused a, a bump in unemployment of the following sort. I think there's a Becker Friedman Institute paper from Chicago that does this and estimates how many people are still going to be unemployed in six months as a consequence of the, the lockdowns. And you take that and you take the existing knowledge that we have, uh, you know, basically parameters we have from uh, papers that are out there and say every person who's unemployed by six months translates statistically uh, into a certain increase in mortality and various diseases. That's what we do. I mean, my real field here is environment. Uh, one of my fields is environmental regulation. The Environmental Protection Agency is a public health agency. 
all the regulations we have, all the regulations that are promulgated are justified by reductions in premature excess mortality. Um, so EPA is a public health agency, and all they do is, const- is calculate uh, for purposes of regulatory impact analyses the number of statistical lives saved by regulations. Well, you just flip that around. We can cal- calculate the number of statistical lives lost due to unemployment. I think we'll now go to qu- to questions. Um, uh, once again, if you want to get on the line for that star star nine, if you're on the phone or if you're not, if you're on Zoom, I'll click the raise hand button. I will also remind people at the end of this panel, uh, when the panel finishes, we're going to go directly to the short address by uh, uh, Chairman Hedget Pai. But uh, um, let's go to our first question, uh, Stephen Landsman. I'd like to thank the panel for a very interesting presentation. And I would begin by uh, sharing with Professor Ayers the concern about Black Lives Matter and not sure that the Federalist answer is entirely satisfactory. Be that as it may, uh, moving on from there, I I think it's important to respond to Professor Johnson. And um, I think that as I think about it, there is a great deal to say And I think Professor Milani has given part of it. That is that we live in a world of partial data at best, sometimes inaccurate data. And to make the sorts of decisions and the sorts of arguments that Professor Johnson would like to make sort of troubles me because of the lack of data. And that without emphasizing the need for more data and more careful data, this is, you know, sort of an argument that doesn't have a sound basis. It's an argument from hindsight. In addition, I would say that the problem about uh, unemployment really presumes the government will do nothing about the data that Professor Johnston has. It won't act in ways that would ameliorate the problems that we know of befallen people have been put out of work in the past. Now, you know, that assumes that government does nothing and can do nothing. Uh, that's not a steady state kind of universe uh, that we live in, but something very different. As to the private market, just to be very brief, I think about the collapse of 2008 and think that the private uh, uh, sector hasn't been brilliant. Richard Posner, now to cite an economics uh, pillar, has suggested real problems in the private industry and a, a real inclination to impose loss on the vulnerable. So that I'm not sure that the uh, vulnerable who seem to be um, uh, desire to be protected here are being protected. Thanks. If um, oh, I mean, there was, there's a lot in that question, but I wasn't talking about hindsight. Like, I'm just talking about updating policies as the data comes in. The data is coming in from Scandinavia and what happened when they've opened the schools. Uh, the data came in from Australia about school children. Uh, they actually ran a study, you know, it's a, I think it's a published paper. It's not just sort of data pouring in from a real life experiment uh, on uh, that kids don't get the disease and they don't generally transmit the disease. So I'm just talking about updating policies and beliefs on the basis of the data as it comes in. That's not hindsight. Uh, that's rational updating and, and, you know, rational policy making. Can I uh, add in one more thing here? I think one thing that, that, that these discussions sometimes get trapped in is the idea of thinking about, the, about all markets working or all governments being good or bad. And I think that the reality that we've encountered is that there's a high amount of variation. Both some markets work well, some markets are, have high degrees of concentration, so you have bad behavior. Uh, we have some good government officials, some bad government officials, and sometimes they fight. And so it's kind of important to go beyond just thinking in broad categories, but talking about specific modes of behavior by government or certain types of markets as being well-functioning markets or poorly functioning markets uh, and so on. And I, I think that would be healthy. Um, we found that, that we've made the most progress uh, with government officials that were willing to update on the basis of new information, are willing to change their policy uh, as that comes along. And we find that sometimes uh, they're bad politicians that are really, or bureaucrats that are just interested in protecting their turf or uh, uh, defending their pride, and that, that gets to be a, a challenge. And, and we don't think that that's a general commentary about government. We think that's about specific people or maybe processes that enable the bad forms of behavior 
uh, to persist uh, within government. Same thing in, in, in markets. And I couldn't agree more about what you just said about markets. Look, there are companies that can, look, there are CEOs that can, can keep their jobs and make $50 million a year for a decade making bad decision after bad decision because they don't have board monitoring and they just stay there. And then there's other companies such as Andy Grove's uh, discussion about Intel and that environment, that market environment, which is so competitive and so dynamic that mistakes are penalized very, very quickly and there are the market discipline there. Sometimes market discipline is there, sometimes market discipline isn't there. And I'd add the same about government. Sometimes there are cultures within particular bureaus or agencies that are truly exceptional and extraordinary. And sometimes they're sleepy and uh, wooden headed. And uh, you know, it's ultimately an empirical question how often you find one as opposed to the other and what you can do about it. Okay, uh, next question uh, from Paul Laskow. Um, so I oh. think I've got it unmuted. Uh, yeah. Congratulations to Jason on the best uh, virtual background. That certainly looks like uh, the standard professor's uh, <laughs> office. Uh, my question is, has anyone looked at the, um, uh, every week we're, we're told by our governors here in the Northeast, I'm in Philadelphia, uh, we're told that uh, Governor Murphy and Governor Cuomo and Governor Wolf are all coordinating closely, but you see things like daycares never closed in Brooklyn, where one of my daughters lives, but daycares in Philadelphia remain closed and will not open until we reach the so-called new normal. Uh, but they all claim to be driven by the same science. And I wonder whether any of you have looked at the Carnegie Mellon University uh, dashboard, data dashboard that uh, our Governor Wolf uh, purports to use, which to get from red to yellow, you had to go to uh, 50 cases uh, per 100,000 per four, uh, over a 14 day period. And that was the big hurdle you had to get over until it just disappeared without explanation. And our incurious media has not examined this or any other changes uh, in the so-called uh, CMU dashboard. Has anyone looked at that or looked at Pennsylvania in, in terms of its uh, uh, generously called reg regulatory regime? <laughs> uh, I, I have not I have not, but this sounds like federalism in action um, with all of its advantages and all of its disadvantages. I will say the only thing I know about Pennsylvania is I have a close friend whose factory um, was shut down immediately uh, as non-essential by the governor. And he uh, and uh, some others immediately brought a lawsuit uh, alleging that it was a uh, temporary taking among other things. And uh, he, I have gotten the list from, he sent me the list that you have in your state of essential versus non-essential businesses. And um, I'm a little, it's a little perplexing uh, just looking at it. I, it it's not, uh, not obvious to me at first what the criterion, criteria were for determining essential versus non-essential. Let's go to our next question in line. Uh, while we're waiting, could I ask a question to Anoop and David? Um, on these contract, contact tracing apps, um, are they doing uh, providing a rich enough set of feedback? Uh, uh, Anoop, you mentioned uh, super spreading events. And it seems to me that a, a tracing app could not only tell you if you were in contact with somebody who tested positive, but in real time, it might tell you that you were right now in the midst of a super spreading event or that like our phones tell us how much time we spent on them. They might tell us on a periodic basis, how many people we've been in contact with and whether it's more or less than uh, similar people like us or is that happening or is it, I've only seen that they're going to tell you if 
uh, you've been near someone who tested positive? So there are efforts, uh, obviously, in the United States and also in India. Uh, there are some technical difficulties, but they can be informative. So the technical difficulties is that your GPS on a typical phone is not very precise. Uh, and it's not merely being the vicinity, it's how long you're in the vicinity to, yeah. Uh, yeah. which is a little bit more complicated. It gets even more complicated when you're in a building because you all show up at the same spot. And so you might not be interacting because you're in different floors. So these are some difficulties that are technical difficulties that we can't answer. However, the contact tracing apps can be helpful in terms of generally knowing, for example, is there more contacts relative, to, even, even, even if you have measurement error, if there's right. relatively more contacts in some places as opposed to others, so you can identify potential places to have outbreaks. The one thing that gets a little bit complicated is that we don't actually have true disease state for any individual. So I might know that you are in the, in the vicinity of somebody that at some point in the past was infected, but I don't know when his or her infection turned into a recovery, in which case there's not a risk. Um, so that, that gets to be a little bit complicated too. So the intertemporal dynamics complicate matters uh, just a little bit. Um, we're still just learning about the kind of the, the flow, the, 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 the time evolution of antibodies. Uh, uh, that's still kind of an open question. Uh, as we learn more about that, I think it'll become helpful because if you have a positive test, I can tell you what an outer bound is when you become recovered. And then the contact tracing app, can, you can at least, you know, kind of, turn red dots into green dots. And so you don't have to worry about those contacts. Does that help? Well, I didn't quite know. Are they giving individuals feedback on their be own behavior? They can. I don't think that's being used. I haven't heard that specifically being used. I think some people have proposed it. Right now, it's mainly governments and organizations okay. trying to figure out are there risk events. Um, uh, next question, I believe Eric Rasmussen. Um, uh, can you hear me or see me? What yeah, we can ideas? hear, although it's a little, speak up because it's a little soft. Okay. Um, the irrationality question is really interesting. And I think part of the reason things look irrational now is we're academics and we specialize in wild and crazy novel <laughs> ideas. And of course, uh, Professor Ayers is the master uh, of this. Um, and uh, in, in ordinary times, people don't pay as much attention because usually our ideas aren't, aren't all that good. But um, when there's an emergency <laughs> like now, everything changes and all the rules of thumb and standard procedures and things fail and most people just don't know what to do and they end up doing really stupid things. And that's where we come into our own. But my question is um, how, or we, how we should come into our own, but how do we get the ideas to the governors and such? Um, so what should we do as public intellectuals? Should we be writing op-eds? Should we be writing our state senators? Or uh, well, if we can't really do because we're not politically connected yet, most of us? Or what sort? Of, how, how should we be doing this? How can we get the good ideas across? Because the politicians want to do the right thing. That's another thing. It isn't that they, it isn't the usual they have bad motives. I think it's more that they truly are confused. And their regular experts are people like the CDC people who have no idea what to do in a crisis because they're bureaucrats. Um, or, and there are scientists who are unimaginative standard procedure people, or they're people who are bureaucrats who are used to always following the rules and not getting into trouble. So what can we do? Can I take this question? So I've been spending the last 10 years or so uh, trying to address this issue, and, and I have a few, few thoughts. The first is, I think that one of the difficulties that government officials have is figuring out who to trust. They don't know ahead of time uh, what the right answer is, the right methodology is. Uh, and so they face that fundamental issue of they don't know which expert is saying the, the right thing, especially when experts say different things, which often happens when you don't have a lot of information. Second, I think that relationships really matter and relationships built during peacetime really give you a lot of leverage uh, when it's wartime. What do I mean by that? I mean that I found that in, 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 uh, for Indian states where I'd had uh, relationships before, where I've worked with bureaucrats, helped them on mundane things, that then when it came to COVID issues, they were willing to listen to me as opposed to some other people. So building those relationships matter. It also can explain why it is that so many governments now these days are relying on consultants. Consultants during peacetime have built up relationships uh, with government officials, uh, helping them on things that we may not find that interesting, uh, not enough to divert our, us from our research interests. Uh, and that those relationships mean that when COVID hit, uh, those government officials were willing to, to listen to those same consultants rather than what we would think of as epidemiological experts or economics experts or whatnot. And I think so those, those relationships are, are really important. I think in terms of the, 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 the kind of the policy debate, 
the one last thing I would say is that we find that there's um, a kind of a filtering that goes on. So you may have a range of ideas, but it's gonna be some newspaper uh, that's gonna determine or an editorial office that's gonna determine whether they like your idea and how they edit your idea. And so there is a, it's kind of a, a choke point there that I think it's important to, to, to consider. Um, I'm not sure that whether that function is done well or poorly, I'm not commenting on that, but I do know that that is a choke point for using op-eds uh, to get your ideas out. <clears throat> Um, so I just add to that. I've done lots of op-eds and my experience has been uh, the only people that read them are the people that agree with you already, at least in the you know political policy domains. Um, and so I don't think that's such a great way based on my own experience, which may be unrepresentative, uh, to get new ideas out, especially when you're in the midst of a crisis. I do want to uh, second an observation that prior relationships developed and, as he put it, peacetime are critical in being viewed as a credible source. I've done this over years uh, at both state and federal levels with malpractice policy and other health policy issues. <clears throat> and when surprise medical bills became an important concern, um, they called me because they knew me from other domains. I have to unmute myself. I'm talking, but not being heard anyway. Um, I just want to say quickly, I think the design of institutions to make sure that differing points of view get expressed so you consider, for example, what's going on with unemployment and uh, closure of businesses, how it, that impacts health is crucial. And so I looked at the president's uh, task force and the treasury secretary's on it. True. And there's some other people with kind of a come from more, um, you know, the, the economics business side. But you had doctors from the CDC, and these CDC doctors are not people who are quantitative epidemiologists. Um, and so they're giving you their point of view. But there wasn't another point of view expressed that the task force didn't seem to me to be comprised in a way um, to present rigorous points of view. And again, it's very quick, very emergency situation, but it just didn't seem to me to be comprised in a way so enough different points of view were being expressed. Um, we don't do that with a lot of things. EPA passes regulations through a process that I think is fundamentally defective. Uh, climate change policy is made through a process of science assessment that's fundamentally defective. If there are ways to fix these things, these institutions can be fixed. But if we don't fix the institutions to get the information to decision makers, we're not going to have the right policies. Uh, okay. Uh Next question, please. Wesley Hello. Payne. Hey, good afternoon, uh, panelists. I hope you guys are doing well, actually, and good morning to others. I have a question regarding to who do you think should be the lead for data management? I know we've talked about uh, the government, private actors, but what about not for profits? And the reason why I say this is we have to consider that there's no comprehensive federal law for privacy. Yes, we have HIPAA, but that's a law of exchange. And yes, we have the FCRA, but that's a law of credit reports. And then the other consideration is that the government usually's mission statement is deemed by law, whereas corporations are deemed by their shareholders, uh, their board members, and profits, but they have more money. They, they're, they're more industrious. As uh, David Hyman might say that we might have a a corporation that's willing to work harder on this than the government. And in some cases, the government has more spirit to do it, et cetera. Do you think that maybe comparing all these three models, who'd be the best at leading data management and regarding going forward? Thank you, everybody. And Ian Ayers, a uh, great comment. Uh, he said earlier about Black Lives Matter. Uh, I understand Federal Society's stance. I'm, I'm a staunch member since uh, law school. I've I feel that they could do more, but I understand why they shouldn't do a policy because they don't do policies on that, but they do talk about discussions regarding the power of the prosecutor. And I think they could push more issues that were regarding the effect the lives of black people and generally everybody else. Yeah. So I, uh, Ian, please, you were about to say something. I was going to say that the uh, uh, I, I do think uh, our government has not been nimble to uh, create a data force uh, to 
uh, do some of the things that Jason uh, suggested and that uh, uh, Kotlikoff has suggested. And uh, Lewis Kaplow had a great op-ed on randomization in the New York Times that uh, we should, uh, uh, this would have, even with limited testing capacity, we should have been uh, uh, more systematically doing randomized testing. Some states like Connecticut are doing it, but it's, a, it's way, way late. And having the government imprimatur, even for voluntary programs, the Gates Foundation has a pretty good app that does another thing that Jason asked for, that you can just, uh, every day it asks you, uh, hey, do you think you have any symptoms? It's uh, just op opt-in voluntariness. But if the government was behind it and said, what's something you could do to help him while you're sheltering in place, we could have gotten a lot more uh, data. Uh, and it's just not something that is central during the middle of a war, uh, it seems to collect that. And, and it's a great idea if we, as we prepare for the next war. Uh, yeah, so I just wanted to add uh, a few things uh, on that. So, so the first is, is I think that, that uh, it's not obvious to me which organization should be the best at maintaining data. Uh, I will say that one difficulty that we have is the flow of data. Very often, the government will collect data and then keep it proprietary, uh, keep it private, uh, limit access to it. Uh, there's tons of government data that's quite useful that's sitting on some uh, official's uh, desktop computer and never sees a light of day, but could be uh, very helpful. In fact, I would contend a lot of the parameters that we need to estimate in order to make good policy, that data already exists somewhere. It's just not being shared. Um, my guess is that that happens not only in government, but can also happen in the private sector. Obviously, the private sector uh, can also restrict the flow of data. Now, I also want to point out that I do laud the idea of having nonprofits involved, uh, but I also have worked with enough uh, foundations to know that there's lots of M&E activity that occurs where, again, the data stays quiet. And the reason is because very often nonprofit funders don't necessarily want information on the returns to their investment made public either. Uh, so I think we all kind of share a collective blame in not uh, sharing data. Um, an important issue is privacy, but the hard part with privacy is sometimes people use privacy because it's really a concern, but other times people use privacy as an excuse not to share information that's not that that's not does not make them look good, and it's very hard to distinguish between those two things. And when we can do that, uh, I think we'll be in a position, but hopefully we'll be able to share more data more quickly and get answers to these questions. Resolve, for example, some of the irrationality that, that, that Jason was worrying about. Um, I also think it's important to, to just at least uh, add a little bit to the Black Lives Matter discussion. I, I think it's very hard to ignore uh, the discussion about it. I think one of the things that makes it very hard for people to comment is just because Black Lives Matter is three words that has a lot of meaning, that, uh, but yet people have a lot of heterogeneity and views about mm -hmm. what exactly are good policies. Um, so if there's a way to broaden the discussion so that you can have it without having to adhere to a set of policies that people associate with that with a particular movement, that would be great because I think it is important to have uh, a broad discussion about race and kind of evolve as a society. Um, my two cents. If I could just add in just briefly. So uh, I, I can understand uh, organizations not taking positions on anything, but uh, Again, if you just Google Federal Society and Black Lives Matter, you uh, by who you choose to invite to give speeches, there are a lot of speeches from Federal Society groups on the war on police, and it's harder to find uh, speeches, invited speeches by Federal Society groups uh, that uh, would play, uh, which would also be central to protecting the civil rights of, of people to uh, protest and uh, uh, walk through the world without being hassled, uh, without being killed. Uh, and, and so uh, more balance in uh, the invitations uh, 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 that still could be emphasizing libertarian aspects uh, of uh, the Black Lives Matter movement. So let me just add, I've been to plenty of Federalist Society events where there have been speakers about overcriminalization and qualified immunity. And those yeah. are, even if they're not explicitly tied to Black Lives Matter, they implicate the same sets of issues. Yeah. Circling back um, to what Anup said, I, I certainly agree that people use HIPAA um, all the time 
for reasons that have little to do with the interest HIPAA was intended to protect. Um, I used to tell students, whenever healthcare providers didn't want to do something, they just say HIPAA, and that would, would be the end of the discussion. Um, last, on the, the issue of getting nonprofits involved, Bernie Black and I uh, spent a considerable amount of time trying to pull together a data hub for information about healthcare, um, and we found it exceptionally difficult to find funders uh, who were interested in giving money uh, for that effort, even though there was nothing specific, particularly political about it. Um, so the nonprofits are only going to do it if somebody gives them money to do it. Um, the for-profits are obviously focused on making money from doing it. And the government, you know, Congress oversight, the example I like to give is the National Practitioner Data Bank collects information on every physician who's had a paid malpractice claim, but you can't identify any of those providers, even though they collect this information and make it available. And uh, they're very limited in who they'll give access to even information on the specialty of those physicians. So we have this wonderful database that's not nearly as useful as it ought to be. Um, I think we're, we're coming close to the end. Um, so uh, I want to call on the next questioner, but um, questions and, and, and answers should be kept short. Next. Oh, Professor Lawson. Hi, thanks. Um, since I have three economists here and a doctor who could probably play an economist on TV if he wanted to. Here's the simple question. Uh, Jason had mentioned the lack of concern for costs that pervaded early policies here. Is it something as simple as that which is seen and that which is not seen, which is a fallacy that pervades virtually every policy in every context that one sees? Why would one expect policy in this area to be any different? Are we just seeing what everybody should have expected us to see? I, I don't think that's, that may be part of the explanation. I think the better explanation is um, sector specific expertise. If you want to know about clinical medical issues, you talk to doctors and epidemiologists. If you want to know about economic costs, you talk to economists. And because CDC, FDA, and HHS are taking the lead, they're focusing on what they spend all their time worrying about, which is health. I'm a little bit more attractive to, the, to this idea that salience plays uh, uh, not the only role, but a, a very large role in this. And, uh, and one test of it, Gary, is if, uh, if things uh, continue and uh, we start seeing people that can't uh, make their rents come out uh, and become visible uh, in large numbers, uh, uh, that could uh, change the political calculus. Uh, if they start being seen, uh, I would imagine we'll we'll see a different uh, uh, we'll see different kinds of updating. Does anyone have any uh, uh, last words uh, they they wish to uh, uh, they wish to say? Since we've got about about one two minutes left. Thanks for allowing us to participate and open this uh, conference. Yeah, thank you very much. Very informative. Very fun. Very important. Thank you. Thank you. Well, appreciate all all of your participation very very much. Uh, Th th thank you. Uh, uh, look, look, look forward to, to further discussions and appreciate your setting this off as, uh, to, su to such a good start.